the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. He is called an ordained servant of Christ by his authority. Therefore, forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity and the undivided unity. Let us give glory to Him because He has shown His mercy to us. set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants you have established strength. <laughs> Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity and the undivided unity. Let us give glory to him because he has shown his mercy to us. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth.
be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity by the confession of a true faith and to worship the unity and the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign one God now and forever. Testament reading for the festival of the Holy Trinity. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and a train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> Paul's letter to the church at Rome, the 11th chapter. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. according to St. John, the third chapter. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the gospel of the Lord.
you the peace and joy which come only from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because he is the one who was, who is, and who is yet to come. We can see. The text for today is the gospel that was just read to you. You heard Nicodemus say it, and he was absolutely right. Christ was a teacher come from God. Christians are taught by Christ. So if you aren't taught by Christ, you can't be a Christian. Now this means, unfortunately, that there are Christians and there are those who just think that they are. Too many believe that Christian means only that you seek to be this kind of decent and kind person. So if you call yourself a Christian, you have to be nice. And among other things, never judge anyone else's religion. However, Christ, the teacher of all Christians, says this is not true. Being nice does not make you a Christian. Christians aren't Christians because they think they are, or because they want to be, or because they want others to think that they are. Christ, the teacher of all who are Christians, says in order to be a Christian, you must be born again. And you know that this birth has nothing to do with a physical birth. Being born again is spiritual. The fact is, every human being born into this world is born spiritually dead. It's as Christ Jesus says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and the flesh hates God. So this means, by nature, everyone born into this world is without any kind of power to think in a truly spiritual way. Because from the flesh come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, and the like. Human beings naturally think like the fallen and sinful people that they were born. So, <clears throat> before anyone can be taught by God, the teacher sent by God, before anyone can be Christian, they must be born again. But you see, these words have been corrupted by those who refuse to simply listen to what God's Word says. They have this odd opinion that you are born again by your decision, as when you supposedly invite Christ into your heart to become your personal Savior. But Christ, the teacher come from God, says, No man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Spirit. You cannot, by your own power, bring about the new spiritual birth. Only the Holy Spirit can do this. And Christ explains how he does it. I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You see, the Spirit of God causes the spiritual birth by means of holy baptism. It's exactly what Christ meant when he said, you must be born of water and the Spirit. Now there's a technical term for Christ's teaching that only the Holy Spirit gives the new birth and eternal life through the washing of holy baptism. It's called the doctrine of baptismal regeneration. Now most Protestants and Lutherans are often wrongly lumped with the Protestants. Most of the, the Lutherans, the, the, these uh, the Protestants deny baptismal regeneration. But the teacher from God teaches it. It is a precious truth. It is to be held with fervent faith. Now the chief reason that the Protestants don't believe in baptismal regeneration is because they have decided, they have reasoned that God cannot or does not attach spiritual power and benefit to things like water and wine and bread. The same complaint that they have about a pastor's authority to forgive sin with the words of absolution. Now it's true. It's true. Water is just water. And of itself, it has absolutely no power to save anyone. But when God joins water to his command and promise, water becomes, as Titus 3 says, a washing of regeneration and a renewal of the Holy Spirit. So you see, the Protestant rejection of baptism's power to give the new birth comes from making God's word subservient to what God, to what human beings think is possible. But if you're taught by the teacher who has come from God, 
It has to be the other way around. Human reason must always be subject to what God says. And yet, the protests of the reasoners cry out. But, 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 but what about the, 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 the baptized who grow up to live godly lives? If baptism is a means of grace, they would say, by which the Holy Spirit gives a new birth that ushers the baptized into the kingdom of God, how do you explain all those baptized deniers of Christ? Are they born again? And finally, what does their unbelief say about the doctrine of baptismal regeneration? And the answer from the scripture is not one thing. You see, the Holy Spirit does not force, coerce, or bully. He enters in. He reveals God. He brings light. He seeks to lead the baptized into the true faith. So, so that then, why is it that some, some who hear the Holy Spirit's call to faith, that others, at the same time who've heard those same things, reject Him, or believe in Him for a while and then fall away? Listening to Scripture, may not be humanly satisfying. We like to reason things out, but Scripture gives the answer. You see, only God knows how and why He does what He does. We simply take Christ at His word when He joins the Holy Spirit's promise to the water of baptism. We don't try to figure out the Holy Spirit as if He's some sort of riddle to be understood. We don't ask why He converts this one and not another. Romans chapter 11 just read to you, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments, for who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been His counselor? For from Him and through Him and to Him, to him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. You see, we humans have no right to ask why or even exactly how. His ways and His thoughts are too high for us. Rather, you look to what God gave you in your baptism. There is your new birth, your new life, and an entirely new way of believing and thinking. <laughs> Holy baptism unites you with both Christ's death and His resurrection. Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried with Him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with Him by baptism in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. Christ the teacher who came from God said to Nicodemus, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You must be born again. To enter God's kingdom, receive his love, be forgiven all your sin, be claimed as his dear child and given the gift of eternal life. The Holy Spirit does this by directing your eyes through the water and the word to where Christ is lifted up for you. Baptism always directs you to Christ's cross. You remember well that Israel constantly complained about their life in the wilderness. And let's face it, 40 years in the desert. It was hard, it was tiresome, it was tedious, and it was boring. But what they resented the most was having to trust God for their daily bread. They were just sick and tired of that manna. And so they complained. And in doing so, they put God on trial. So what did God do? He sent poisonous snakes to bite them. And when they were dying from the poison, when they finally saw their sin, it was then that they cried out to God for help. And so God told Moses to put a bronze serpent on the pole. God promised that all who looked up to the snake on the pole would be saved from the poison. And God kept his promise. Unfortunately, putting God on trial isn't unusual. It's the way that sinful flesh works. We like to make God the accused and judge him. Whole congregations and church bodies do this. Rather than proclaim without qualification what God says, what he wants, 
they decide that what they want and what the public might be looking for is something that they can work. And according to human reason, they figure out how to market the church so that the church will become acceptable to the people. They call it being seeker-sensitive. Christ, our teacher from God, condemns this human reasoning. He denounces anything that waters down this and eliminates that so that people will just happily sit in pews and, and listen to what it is that pleases them. God and His will must never be put on trial. God isn't some disinterested father. You can't judge him. He judges you. And when he does bring judgment, the snakes come to bite. Their fangs will inject their poison. And without repentance, all people believe that they know better than God. And when they believe this, without that repentance, they will die in pain and hopelessness. Christ says, you must be born again. You must have new spiritual life, life eternal given to you. And that life is in Christ's cross. And that cross just defies human reason. Why would God have his son lifted up in your place? It makes no sense. Why would God completely forgive in this way? And yet, it is God's decision. We do not look for another way. On that cross is your God, and your God put him there for you. He so loved the world that he gave his only son. Christ Jesus said, I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. The word of the cross, coupled <coughs> by God's command with simple water, <coughs> regenerates and gives eternal life. The baptismal water is joined in the holy, precious blood of Christ for you as it flows from the cross. God is triune. He says so. The Holy Trinity is the only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in the baptism that Christ gave, the baptized are connected to this one and only God, the only one who can rescue you from your sin and give you eternal life. Holy baptism gives the fullness of God and all of his gifts to the baptized. So, holy baptism is the means by which the Holy Spirit works the new birth. But baptism isn't the new birth. Baptism just brings it about. The new birth, the spiritual birth, is the dying and rising from the dead. Baptism causes your old self to die and your new self to rise from its waters. Oh yes, we the baptized sadly still sin every day. We lie and say that we don't, but we do. And still we complain and judge and put God on trial, and that certainly is sin. And that sin calls for the poisonous serpents to bite and to kill us dead. But remember, you're baptized. So when you see the serpent attack, and you feel the pain of the poison oozing through your body, making you afraid, look up. See Christ of the cross suffering for you. By gracious faith, you are reclaiming your baptism. The Holy Trinity will save you from the poison that will destroy your soul. Baptismal faith believes God, and that faith will set you free. Confessing the Holy Trinity, as we will in a few moments, is believing in Him. The one who was lifted up on the cross to suffer and to die for your sin. God himself works that faith in you by holy baptism, by the gospel that you hear, by the holy supper that you eat and the drink, and by the absolution that he pronounces upon you. It even works in you by that mutual conversation and comfort that you receive from your fellow Christians and that God gives you in Christ as a great blessing. To be born again doesn't require religious experience that you can, that you can put down as a day that you can remember to be born again is to believe and to be baptized. Born again Christians don't rely on good works, good intentions, or their devotion to God for entrance into eternal life. Christians trust Christ, He who died for them, 
that trusted the forgiveness of sin flowing from Christ's blood on the cross, flowing into the waters of holy baptism with which we have been washed. Christians are disciples of Christ. We learn from Him throughout our earthly lives, but we know that we will never get better than the day that we were baptized. For on that day, God put His name on you, and He put His Savior in you to be reborn from above, to give you God's kingdom, and so to be received in eternal, to eternal life through faith in Jesus' precious name. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Whoever desires to be saved must, above all, hold the Catholic faith. Whoever does not keep it whole and undefiled will, without doubt, perish eternally. And the Catholic faith is this that we worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance. For the Father is one person, the Son is another, and the Holy Spirit is another. But the Godhead of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, and the Holy Spirit uncreated. Father infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. Just as there are not three uncreated or three infinite, but one uncreated and one infinite. In the same way, the Father is Almighty, the Son Almighty, the Holy Spirit Almighty, and yet there are not three Almighty, but one Almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord, and yet there are not three Lords, but one Lord. Just as we are compelled by the Christian truth to acknowledge each distinct person as God and Lord, so also are we prohibited by the Catholic religion to say that there are three gods or Lords. The Father is not made nor created nor begotten by anyone. The Son is neither made nor created, but begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is the Father and the Son, neither made nor created, nor begotten, but proceeding. Thus there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. And in this Trinity, none is before or after another. None is greater or less than another, but the whole three persons are co-eternal with each other and co-equal, so that in all things, as has been stated above, the Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity is to be worshipped. Therefore, whoever desires to be saved must think thus about the Trinity. But it is also necessary for everlasting salvation that one faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is the right faith that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is at the same time both God and man. He is God, begotten from the substance of the Father before all ages, and He is man, born from the substance of His mother in this age. Perfect God and perfect man, composed of a rational soul and human flesh. Equal to the Father with respect to his divinity, less than the Father with respect to his humanity. Although he is God and man, he is not two, but one Christ. One, however, not by the conversion of the divinity into flesh, but by the assumption of the humanity into God. One altogether not by confusion of substance, but by unity of persons. For as the 
rational soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ. Who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again in the third day from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people will rise again with their bodies and give an account concerning their own deeds. And those who have done good will enter into eternal life. Those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For a faithful preaching of Christ's saving name, that God's people may be strengthened in faith and his kingdom extended. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The church throughout the world, that God would guard and defend her from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our flesh. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer this congregation, its preaching and its people, the ability to meet the needs that arise as we do the work God has given us to do, and for the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who have wandered from the faith, the Holy Spirit would use us to call them home to the Father. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the government, all who have been given into positions of leadership, that they may use the authority given to them honorably and for the good of the people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who suffer from hunger, homelessness, poverty, unemployment, that God's great mercy and love would preserve and relieve them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all the faithful that the Spirit would lead them to cheerful, generous giving, the bounty the Lord gives, support the church and help those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who are sick, especially Lou Shaw, Arliss Van Ness, Alan Mosco, Debbie Cantrill, Richard Pine, God would grant healing to their bodies, strength to bear their infirmities, patience, and grace. Lord, in your mercy, for those who mourn, especially the family of Vern Korowitz, that in their time of sorrow, they would not lose hope, but rely on God's promise, the resurrection, that he will never leave or forsake us. Lord, in your mercy, for those who rejoice in the rich of the blessings of God, especially uh, Joshua Stuckler and Lisa Brindle, at their marriage yesterday, that they may remember the giver of every gift and give him heartfelt thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord God, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, for he ever stands as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. For you alone we give all glory, honor and worship. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Welcome to all of you this morning. It is our duty and delight to celebrate the sacrament of our Lord's body and blood. We believe, teach, and confess about this sacrament exactly what God's Word says of it, that it offers to us under the outward forms of bread and wine, the very body and the very blood of Christ, according to His promise. And it gives us the forgiveness of sin for which we have such great need. 
We believe, teach, and confess also that this sacrament is celebrated in the unity of the, of the faith that we confess before this altar. Therefore, along with the Lutheran Church, Mr. Senate, we practice what's called close or closed or fellowship communion. If you're a member of Trinity, if you've spoken to Pastor Show and myself about receiving the sacrament here, or you're a member of another LCMS congregation, you're certainly invited to come to the sacraments day. Fill out the card, put a mark next to your name indicating you went to the sacrament, and hand this card to the usher when you come to the view. If you're visiting with us and, and would like to explore becoming a communicant, if you have a question, if you have a need, if there's any way we can help you, we'd love to do that. Please indicate that for us on the visitor side of the card, fill it out, lay it beside you in the pew, and you'll be picked up after this divine service.
teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you, body and soul, unto life everlasting. Pardon in peace. Amen. Sanctuary here itself. 